is Dallas week. First place in the NFC East, eight and four Dallas Cowboys are coming to land over uh, to play Washington in this pivotal, both just divisional and rivalry matchup. I gotta say, this is the most hype that there's been going into one of these games in a long time. It feels like both from player comments, coach comments, we even got Jerry Jones chiming in this morning on Friday afternoon when this is getting recorded. This is the Burgundy and Gold Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jess of HTR.Nation with Sam of WSH Football 365, the dynamic duo. And this episode is sponsored by WinView Games, the nation's sports prediction leader and home for pregame and live Washington football prop contest. I know all of you live and breathe Washington football, so if you want to put that knowledge to the test, download WinView right now. That's winview.tv backslash burgundy gold. Again, that's winview.tv backslash burgundy gold. Play against other people in free or real money contests. You can also find the link in our Instagram bio. That's at the BNG review. Play your first $20 risk-free with Washington football contests every day. Now until the end of the season, which is quickly coming upon us. I know this happens for all of you. Now, Sam. I do believe you are going to the game. That is correct. I will be in attendance on Sunday. Uh, hopefully there is more Washington fans than Dallas fans, but regardless, we're still going to try to lose our voices that game. Yeah, I mentioned right at the beginning that this is definitely the most hype it feels like that's been around on these games, both for, for stakes in the game and just – Fan base is chirping where you actually feel like both teams are in a close level of competition or they're both at the same kind of level of the quality of team. It's it'll be interesting. I mean, Washington is coming into this game pretty, pretty banged up. Uh, it's not to say Dallas doesn't have their fair share of injuries, but the injury bugs been hitting Washington hard this past month or so. But I mean, if anything is the last, this last month of the season has showed us that, uh, Team's got some grit. They've got some fight, and they're gonna they're gonna have a competitive game. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely getting a lot of hype. Uh, you know, last year it didn't seem like, even though we won two big games by pretty large margins both times, it wasn't against Dallas full strength. And it seems like over the years, both teams really haven't played each other when they were both like pretty good. You know, and it's kind of been a while. It seems like it's been pretty much 2012 the last time where they had like this December type feeling with our quote unquote biggest rival. So it's nice to have that back. I love, even though the the headlines and the news are ridiculous, some of the shade getting thrown back and forth that you mentioned between Jerry Jones, Ron Rivera, Mike McCarthy, or whatever. Uh, it's it's still the the hype is there. It's fun. We have meaningful December football. Uh, hopefully, we get a Washington W this week as we head towards the playoffs because this is exciting. You know, you mentioned it's the first time in a while it feels like that both teams have been. Uh, at a close level of, of play, both also being healthy coming into the matchup. I've seen last year's matchups, Washington uh, got to play Andy Dalton instead of Dak Prescott. Cowboys definitely had some other injuries that Washington uh, definitely benefited from or was able to take advantage of as we dominated Dallas in the 2020 games. In 2019, Washington was obviously pitiful. Uh, that last game of the season, they lost like 40-16, to 16, I believe. It was they were playing backup guys that got cut the next week in that game. And to begin that season, Washington wasn't very good to, uh, to start off with. In 2018, Dallas was fortunate to catch Washington. I mean, they got that really fun victory, uh, that 2018 one, where Brett Maher banged it off the upright, uh, the controversial penalty to end that one. But then Dallas benefited from Washington getting to play on a short week right after Alex Smith's injury. Uh, 2017. Washington just wasn't very good, or they were at least very below average. And then, so I feel like, you know, you mentioned that 2012, 2012 matchup, excuse me, I'm stumbling over myself a bit here. You mentioned that 2012 matchup. I also think those 2016 games uh, were good ones with the Kirk Cousins 8-7-1 Washington team that should have been a lot better than they ended up being. I mean, at Thanksgiving Day 1, Washington lost, but I remember that being a really, really fun game uh, where Washington was at a – high level or at least a, a, an above average level of competition. Jess, you bring up a lot of very valid points and it's fun to have the hype back 
in Washington and in this rivalry. I also want to introduce a good friend of ours that's been on the podcast before, and that's Logan Paulson from 1067 and former Washington Redskins tight end. Logan, welcome back to the show. I appreciate you guys having me. Yeah, man, we really enjoy your insight, really enjoy uh, seeing what you post on Instagram. All your playing breakdowns are very high quality, and more people need to see them. I say that all the time. So love to have you back on talking about Dallas. Everybody loves to talk about Dallas week, especially when we're a competing team. So how do you see Washington heading into Dallas? Do you think that their motivation is there? Do you think that they have a big enough chip on their shoulder to take down another proverbial Goliath? Well, I think when Mike McCarthy comes out and says he's guaranteeing a win against the Washington football team, I think that is all the motivation you need, probably. I think that's kind of a ridiculous thing to say. And um, I think that this team does really well with those kinds of external motivation factors, obviously. I think, um, you know, like if I was a player and another coach said that, I would kind of batten down the hatches a little bit more, grind it up a little bit tighter. And I think Ron has kind of played up that David versus Goliath thing over the last couple of weeks of the season. And Mike McCarthy doing that kind of plays into that narrative. So, I think if there's like a, an intrinsic or extrinsic extrinsic factor, like all of a sudden Mike McCarthy's provided it, and I think that that's going to lead to just a heightened sense of of focus and uh, motivation for this group. And that's all we can hope for. And it seemed to have, seems to be a tenacity that they've carried uh, over the last few weeks and and in this four game win streak. Um, you know, with their metaphorical rock against the wall, you have McCarthy on the other side with their watermelon thing that still doesn't make any sense to me. So with those words, that, that hopefully is, is another big bulletin board motivating factor uh, for a Washington win this Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, and, you know, in addition to the kind of the the um, the motivation factors, I think this team matches up OK. You know what I mean? I don't think it's great. I don't think you kind of um, you know, you feel great about it. But I want to look at like Tampa, for example, the Tampa Bay game. This roster of Dallas is constructed in a very similar way to Tampa. They have three kind of starting wide receivers. They have an adequate run, run game, something that they can kind of crutch on, and a quarterback that's playing pretty well. I think Dak, after the calf strain, has not been the Dak of earlier in the season, so there's been a little bit of a deficiency there for, from an offensive standpoint for them. And then when you look at the defensive side of the ball, I think that's the part that makes me the most concerned. They're getting Rand, Randy Gregory back. Demarcus Lawrence is coming back this week. Um Gallium or Gilliam, I don't know how to say his name, the, the three technique who was supposed to be the start at the beginning of the season is all of a sudden back this week. So that defensive front, which was kind of been a little bit patchwork, is now like a, a, a position of strength for them. I think it allows them to move Michael Parsons back to the middle. And I think it just gives them a lot of um, kind of problems. Like when before, you know, these guys come back, it was a very kind of vanilla group of players. You bring up the point of Dallas finally really having a rejuvenated defensive line. You know, all those names ring true as, as good players. Lawrence, Parsons, uh, Gallimore, the defensive tackle you mentioned. And Washington's O-line has been a surprising, uh, really good strength, both uh, how they've graded out analytically and how they've just looked watching the game as a fan. So that's a match where I'm really looking forward to. Obviously, there are some injuries for Washington's side. Uh, Rulier has been out for a bit, so they've been able to adjust to that. But we'll have to see if we get Schweitzer playing. Uh, Tyra Larson's missed a bit. But in the trenches, that's really, I think, where this game comes down to. Obviously, you can say that with any football game, but I think both those are the strength of Dallas's defense, their D-line, and the strength of Washington's offense is their O-line. So along that, uh, or in that matchup, like what will you really be looking forward or looking at, like a share versus Gallimore? Uh, Leno versus Parsons, is there anyone that you really think is vital for Washington to kind of get down and, and ensure they kind of get the edge there? Yeah, so I think the person that I'm going to be kind of keeping an eye on, so to speak, is Scott Turner, because I think he's done a great job over the course of the last four weeks specifically of calling game plans that I don't want to say hide the offensive line, because like you said, they've been playing very well, but kind of limits their exposure to, to good pass rushes and obvious pass rushing situations. Like I was talking to Chris Baker today, he was on the show with me. And he was saying that, um, you know, one of the things he likes about Scott Turner is that he's done a really nice job of keeping them out of really kind of long third down situations. And when you do that, you limit the need for kind of prolific pass rush production from those guys. And like if you look at their first and second down, a lot of runs, a lot of play actions, a lot of keepers, all those variables kind of um, allow them to only have to do like really, really hard work, which is drop back pass protect you know, maybe 10 or 15 times in a game, which is ideal. So if they can kind of stay on schedule, stay ahead of the sticks, keep themselves in manageable, like execute well on second down, keep themselves in manageable thirds, I think that the offensive line performs well. If it turns into they can't run the football because of Dallas's line stunt activity, 
and it gets all kind of in this quagmire of running the football, I think it's going to be really, really challenging for that group to play at a high level, not because that group's going to play badly, but because, you know, when you look at Randy Gregory from earlier in the year, like he was playing like a top five pass rusher. And then when you look at um, Micah Parsons, what he's done, 10 sacks in a, kind of an abridged pass rushing role, that's fantastic. And then Demarcus Loris, who I, I had the privilege of playing against, I know is a headache as a pass rusher and as a, just an every down type of player. You bring Gallimore back, back they have Ojiki Zua in the middle, who's been a nice pass rusher for them. So I think like that group all of a sudden looks very formidable with five kind of legitimate pass rushers. So I think they got to do everything they can to kind of keep on schedule and stay out of those obvious passing situations. Yeah, currently Dallas, their run defense is not very good. They are allowing 111.1 yards per game on the ground, whereas Washington's rush offense is one of the best in the game, I believe top top 10 at this point. Um, but but as you said, they're getting a lot of players back. So it, those numbers might be a little skewed towards when the injuries were there. In fact, mm-hmm. I'm sure that they are. Um, so getting these guys back is going to be a, a big help to them. But, you know, also – Washington has done well on the ground against against quote unquote elite rush defenses, namely in Carolina and Tampa. So I still have confidence in them to stick to the same game plan, regardless of who they put on the field in Dallas. So hopefully we see a big rush, a big rush game again from them, because that's how they've been winning football games. And and controlling the clock is 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 the name of the game for Washington this year. Yeah, I 100% concur. I think they've done it against good competition. So I think that informs that informs the opinion or the belief that they should be okay in this game. But I, I will say that sometimes, like as a former player, going against a team, going against an opponent or at a position you haven't seen a lot over the course of the year, sometimes that's an advantage for the defender, right? Because you don't know exactly how they're going to play. You don't know what they're going to be bringing. So that's something I'm just really keeping an eye on. I, I think they will be able to. They should be able to. But everyone in the country knows that the Washington football team is going to run the football. Dan Quinn, the defensive coordinator for the Dallas Cowboys, knows that they're going to try and run the football. So I would expect him to kind of cultivate a game plan that's designed to stop the football. So like when I watched the New Orleans game, for example, I saw more line stunts by the Dallas Cowboys and um, the New Orleans Saints had a difficult time. A very prolific running football team had a difficult time running the football outside of quarterback runs. So I say to myself, that is a good schematic change by um, that uh, by Dan Quinn and the Dallas uh, defense to kind of mitigate the effectiveness of the run. And I would expect to see a similar game plan. So hopefully a lot of reps this week kind of get right. And especially, you know, like just get right, make sure you can handle those adjustments. But I think it's going to be a tall order from a schematic and from a personnel standpoint. On the other side, Washington's pass defense ranks 30th in the league versus Dallas, who has the number four passing offense in the entire (laughs) league. Uh, Not doesn't look very good on paper, but everyone knows that has been watching the team over the last, you know, four to five weeks that the past defense has immensely improved, especially the corners on the outside and Kendall Fuller and uh, William Jackson, the third alternatively Dak, I think that you mentioned earlier, he doesn't look the same after his calf injury, especially with his willingness, I believe to escape the pocket, which is I think it's going to be a huge factor in this game because if Washington is able to cover their three prolific wide receivers in CeeDee Lamb, Amari Cooper, and Michael Gallup downfield, I'm worried about Dak having the middle of the field to be able to run to or pass to a tight end. So this whole passing game with the built-in running of Dak kind of worries me, and I think that's the focal point of where Washington needs to focus to stop this Dallas offense. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, when I watched it, I watched the last three games for Dallas and uh, you think that they'd be throwing the football all over the yard with the, those three receivers they've got. But in fact, they they tend to be a run first kind of group. If you watch the New Orleans game, if you watch the Raiders game, I think Kansas City is the week before that. Very run centric on first and second down to set up play action. And I think that's going to be a really interesting storyline to keep track of is because, you know, Ezekiel, it's hurt. Uh, Pollard is also hurt, and uh, who's their third running back? Can they still maintain that philosophy? It seems, it almost seems like when you're watching film, they're kind of shying away from Dak Prescott kind of running the offense, which I think is really interesting because on paper, and you talked about how prolific their pass offense is, it doesn't, you'd think that that group would be kind of on full display and the running game would be secondary, but it seems in the film, in at least the last three weeks, and maybe it's because of Dak's injury, that's reversed. So, uh, I'm really interested to see what what happens, you know. And in the last game, they tried to throw the ball a lot against Kansas City. He had three; they had three turnovers. Um, not all uh, Dak's fault, but you know, not playing this clean brand of football that I think everyone saw them playing in the first 
seven, eight weeks of the season. So um, I think that's that to me is maybe the biggest offensive storyline is there's there has to be an identity shift with those two starting running backs out. Do they rely on Dak, which they've seemed reluctant to do? I mean, obviously they have the horsepower on the outside. Those two guys, uh, Lamb, Cooper, are finally healthy. You know, they were kind of banged up over the last two weeks. Cooper had like a, an abridged season, uh, abridged game last week against New Orleans because of the COVID thing. But um, yeah, man, it's it's a really interesting conundrum uh, because of da- Dallas's health and because of like their seemingly kind of backwards play philosophy at the moment. Well, Sam and I, before you hopped on, we're kind of talking about how Washington was on the fortunate end of getting to play very two very banged up Dallas teams last year. Mm. Uh, in, in both those games, we really got to see Washington's defensive line uh, take over a uh, banged up Dallas O-line. But now it's kind of reversed a little bit. Washington's D-line, while they've been really successful, they're missing two of their star guys. And Dallas has Tyron Smith this year. Uh, Zach Martin's obviously been one of the one of the best in the business since he came into the league. So what I'm really interested to hear from you is uh, how do you think Washington's really going to approach, I guess, their game plan uh, against this healthy Dallas line? Because since Young and Sweat have been out, uh, Washington's D line has been uh, better, not because of their absence, but better, I think, because of it's kind of forced coaching to adapt, kind of uh, get some more favorable matchups, kind of. And, you know, Jonathan Allen's had a really great year. Uh, so I guess what will you be looking at there on the flip side of the trenches? Well, it's interesting. I think that when I watched Dallas, I was kind of blown away. Um, and to be fair, against New Orleans, their offensive line coaches, both of them, were out with COVID. They weren't allowed to be on the sideline. And it really, I thought you could see the effect in terms of how they were calling runs. They'd call like single back power. They'd call tight zone. They'd call regular power. And it was very kind of tight engaged runs running into the teeth of the saints defense i thought that's an unusual philosophy against this group that's got a very stout defensive front like why not try to attack the perimeter a little bit more you have tony pollard as an explosive back so um i I think that that's something i'm going to keep an eye on you know like that yes you this they are a very good group but are you utilizing them effectively are you as a staff putting them in the best situations I, i i could see the temptation potentially to be like oh, we've got the best offensive line in the NFL. We're just going to let them block. But still, you have to game plan and find ways to give those guys good opportunities. Um, And I will say that, like, when you watch New Orleans, when you watch um, Oakland to a certain extent, like, those defensive fronts are not great, but they do a good job, uh, kind of to your point. Like, and Jack Del Rio's done a good job of this, too, of finding ways to create one-on-one matchups, finding ways to create from, like, a pressure, from a line stunt standpoint to, to, to kind of stuff runs, and I, I would expect to see something similar. You know, you mentioned uh, the pressure rates and all those things and missing Montez and missing Chase. But I think it's it's forced Jack, quite frankly, to be a little bit more creative, you know. And when you look at New Orleans, they were able to get a lot of pressure on third down because they did a great job with kind of not nothing crazy, but novel pressure packages, you know, stuff that every team runs. But just and everyone was executing. No one got out of their pass lanes, forcing Dak to stay in the pocket with a guy in his face. And so I think it comes down to. A, execution, B, play calling, you know, and I think that's been much improved after the bye. And I think despite that group of Dallas being so skilled, I think it puts the watch. I think the Washington football team has a chance because of how they're playing as a group at the moment. I also will get to toss in there. Your guy, uh, Casey Tuhill is getting some nice, some nice work this season. Obviously, you didn't want to come at the expense uh, of an injury, but nice to see him. I remember you telling him about us back in the summer, so nice to see him getting a chance here. Yeah, man. Really excited for Casey. I talk to him like almost every day on the phone. He's a little bit of a knucklehead, like, uh, you know, gets really nervous and is always in his own space, but man, he, I'm so happy for him and he seems to be playing uh, pretty good football at the moment. So that's always good to see. It's amazing what, what Rivera and Jack Del Rio have been able to do with, you know, guys that in training camp, we weren't even certain if they were going to make the team, much less make a practice squad. So uh, you mentioned how, Dallas might have that mentality where, hey, we have a good offensive line. They just got to go out there and block. Well, on the other side of the ball, it seems like Rivera and and his staff, you know, Del Rio and the other guys in the defensive line are using stunts and and other maneuvers to alleviate, hey, maybe we don't have as much talent as you, but we're going to beat you with technique. So it's kind of cool for me to see that, uh, you know, come from lesser known players, especially somebody like Two Hill that you mentioned before the season started. It's been fun to watch come to fruition. Yeah, and I think, you know, in addition to Casey, James Smith-Williams has been playing really, really well. You yeah. know, he's looked like a, <clears throat> I want to say, like a, not like a game changer, but like looked like a very impactful player when he's on the field. 
you know, he had kind of like a sack, half a sack, and he batted the ball out on that one, and he's kind of making all these tackles. And both those guys are playing with their hair on fire. So it's been a really – I think it's a, it's a testament, obviously, to the coaching, but it's also a, ten, a testament to the talent evaluation, you know. For them to be able to identify those guys and say we feel comfortable with them as the backups, I think is is pretty spectacular from uh, from this coaching staff. I, I totally agree. And and if a couple of those batted balls from James Smith Williams actually had come out or gone a different way, we you know he might be getting a little bit more uh, attention than he is you know from under the radar guys. And yeah, he's a smart player. He's you know making getting these awards off uh, you know outside of football as well. Are really neat to see for guys the kind of guys you want on the field. So yeah, hats off to him as well. And and you know it's it's really neat just watching these guys go from seventh round picks to making uh, you know or undrafted free agents making making an impact in December. So. Absolutely. Going into our score predictions for the game, uh, I think Washington is going to be in another tight one. That's the trend that they've been showing me throughout the year. Uh, but, you know, good teams got to win close games, and they haven't quite proven to me yet that they're a good team. But if they win this one, it just might well be. Uh, I think Washington and Dallas will split 1-1 one -one this year, and I'm just going to go ahead and give them the home game this year since they have so much momentum. I think Washington gets this one 27-26. Um, I like that. I think one of the things that I'm in terms of this score prediction is I think that um, I, I agree. I think 17 points isn't going to cut it. I think that they're going to need to find a way to create some explosive plays on offense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that that 27, 26 is probably right in the ballpark. Um, I think Dallas might score 30 though, is what I would say, you know, like that's a pretty prolific. I know there's, I take that back. They're struggling. I'll say 24 or 21 is what I'm going to say. Washington or Dallas. Oh, put me in a bind. I'm gonna say Washington. I mean, Washington. you know, like we're riding the we're riding the inertia train right now. I'm feeling good. Everyone's hyped up. You know, I think Dallas has a better roster, but I just there's some something a little magic, a little magic about this group at the moment. So, I agree. Uh, I am torn, so torn on where to go here. Usually, I try not to uh, be heat of the moment with my my prediction. I think that. Um, I, I really don't know, know who I want to go here. I do think it will be a close game. I'm, I'm tempted to, to pick a 17 to 15 score again, but I <laughs> probably, probably won't be that kind of low scoring with uh, this Dallas offense coming to town. You know, Dak Prescott's historically been really good against Washington. I think we only have one win against him in his four or five years starting. Uh, but yeah, you got to ride the hype. You got to ride the train. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go with our guys. And, and if, uh, if that ends up not being the case, then won't be kicking myself over it, but I'll go with Washington, Washington, 23, 23 to 20. I think Brian Johnson's going to have a big field goal. Again. Ooh, all right. Just, just, you're so hesitant to be confident in our boys, man. I can, <laughs> I can hear it in your voice. You're so hesitant. Jump on the train, man. It's time. He's been Dude, burned I, a couple times, man. I'm sure. Uh, I've been oh, burned we all by have. Good expectations <laughs> over the years. I've been burned by expectations over the years. So I'd love to be wrong. I would love to be hit, sitting here eating crow. That is that is how I want to be coming in, being proven wrong. But uh, you know, I'll go Washington in a close one. We'll we'll go three for three here. Cautious optimism, I feel, is the best way to approach anything good by a Washington team or Washington football team, rather. Um, if we win this game, I I, I think it's going to have to be by way of the ground and sound defense. And I, my player of the game would have to be a prediction of Antonio Gibson for the third week in a row. Um, 20 plus carries again. I'm going to say 23 carries, 117 yards and a touchdown. Some similar sat line to the last time they played where he had. Uh, three touchdowns and 120 on the ground. So Antonio Gibson to me is the key to this game. Uh, they keep riding him, keep using him as a workhorse, and hopefully get JD McKissick back to spell him and use him on third downs. But I think he would be the player of the game. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the obvious choice. But um, outside of him, I'm going to go Taylor Heineke. I think Taylor Heineke's done a really nice job. Maybe not showing up in a traditional stat sheet type of way, but on third down specifically, he's done a really nice job in terms of helping this offense execute. So look for him to steal a couple uh, third downs, I think. Maybe get a sneaky score here to maybe Ricky Seals Jones, who's coming back from injury, hopefully, and uh, kind of get back in the, uh, you know, I, I just playing solid football for him. Don't put the ball in harm's way. 
You know, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do this when I play with the game picks, but I do think the most pivotal uh, thing that has to get done right by Washington is defensive coaching this game. Uh, and for that reason, I think I, we're, I'm going a little bit outside the box. I know first time, first time we're doing this, but I'm going with Jack Del Rio as Ooh. my player slash, slash coach, slash coach of the game. Uh, I feel like if Washington wants to win this game, we're going to need to see a master class in defensive coaching. I know Del Rio is capable of it. Uh, if we see it Sunday is the question. You know, we've had a really good trend here, uh, and this is a great opportunity against a very, you know, they've been, Dallas' offense has been struggling too, but they have the talent to just score any play if they're healthy. You know, they got multiple guys that can do it in the run game and in the pass game. Uh, I think Del Rio is going to call a really good game, you know, by our predictions. I think Washington gets it. So I think Jack Del Rio's uh, shows off again, defensive masterclass. <laughs> I want to throw one dark horse guy in there really quick, especially just because Logan's on. And we did mention him with, in the last episode we did with you during the season. John Bates. I think My man. Gonna, John Bates, man, is going to start. Ricky Seals Jones, I don't think, is just going to come back and start like taking over all John Bates' snaps. I really don't think. I think we're going to start seeing more and more and more and more from John Bates. And this could be the game where John Bates gets his first NFL touchdown. I'm calling it dark horse little honorable mention to my boy John Bates. I know, I know you like him, Logan. Yeah, I love him. I think you know he's just been playing so physically in the run game, which fires me up every time I watch him. And it would yeah, I think his his uh his presence has added value to Antonio Gibson, you know, your pick for the game. And if he gets his first touchdown, that would be fantastic. That man can block. He really can block. It's yeah. and it's fun to watch his breakdowns. But anyway, Logan, it's been great to have you on. Thank you so much for coming to visit again. And hopefully we can beat Dallas. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, man. Hopefully, uh, next time I talk to you guys, we're like in the playoffs or something. That would be sick. Anyway, that's all we have for you guys this week. And thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Sam of WSH Football 365, and that was Jess of HDTR.Nation. Make sure to follow Logan Paulson on Instagram, where he breaks down all kinds of football plays, and also watch him and listen to him on 106.7. Talk to us next time as we break down the results of the Dallas game. My name's Sam, and thank you so much for tuning in. Go football team.